It's been half a year since Pentecost Sunday, and with this service, we complete the season after Pentecost with today's worship, known as Christ the King. This is actually a pretty new service in the church year. It isn't a principal feast, but it is a theme we return to each year just before we begin the new liturgical cycle of Advent. Christ the King Sunday began as a reaction to the world's power struggles back in the late 1800s. When the great empires at that time, British, American, Spanish, French, German, Russian, and Japanese, they were all at war or they were all about to go to war somewhere. The Pope of the Roman Catholic Church wrote a letter to the world in which he dedicated the world to Christ the King. In the letter, he reminded the world's powers that God is present with the whole human race, even with those who do not know God. In our gospel today from John, written to a congregation of new Christians in Ephesus, the writer shares a conversation at the beginning of the passion of Christ between Pilate, the Roman governor, and Jesus of Nazareth. It takes place at the headquarters of the Roman executive offices in Jerusalem early in the morning. In some ways, this part of the passion of Jesus is a strange reading for Christ the King Sunday. As a rule, kings usually do not stand trial. They rule until their deaths. When another king with more powerful army conquers the king or when the king's subjects rebel and defeat the king, then a king is seldom given a trial. He's just killed. But on the other hand, this is a good text for this Sunday because there's a lot of king and kingdom language in today's reading. Last summer and into the fall, I hope you remember when Matthew was our anchor gospel, we looked at many parables of Jesus that emphasized the now and the not yet of the kingdom of heaven. We had a book study from N.T. Wright, Surprised by Hope. I had referenced Bishop Wright's insights often. I even finished a song that I'd been working on for a long time called Now and Then. Bishop Wright has helped us understand that the kingdom of heaven isn't an alternative place or a state of mind, but it's an awareness of the changing state of God's work in and through us in the now and not yet. For the past three years, my emphasis has been to encourage us to become more action-oriented and intentional in ministries, a ministry of presence. Programs are fine, but programs can detach us from the connection that our faith really needs to make. And that's really a connection of looking into a person's eyes, looking into their souls and letting them see our souls as well. A ministry of presence means you really have to give some of yourself, not just to give to a program. And so the encouraging thing that has been happening over these last three years is that we are less program motivated here and we are more intentional about having ministries of presence, not only inside this space, but outside in that space beyond here. We have begun as a community of faith to integrate our mind space, our heart space, and our body awareness as the hands and heart and face of Jesus in the every place we are. At least that has been the goal. Today, I was so encouraged when Madeline Gerdes was our children's preacher and she was telling the children about the gospel today. Father Ron says all the time, and we're now saying all the time, to be the hands and face and heart of Jesus. What does that mean to you? And she had a picture of Jesus as a man, a caricature of Jesus as a man. She says, we kind of know what Jesus would do as a man, don't we, children? He has strong hands and he was a carpenter. And so he had some skills. And so he could do certain things with those hands. 
And then she began by showing some pictures of babies. But what does a baby do with their hands? And she had these pictures, you know, and they're all in their mouth. and They're looking at that hand and go, what am I supposed to do with this? And she says, a baby uses their hands to explore the world. Explore the world. They find meaning in their exploration. And she says, as we enter the time of Advent, I want you to look at your hands every day and say that you can be the hands of Jesus by exploring your world and finding joy in that. I told her after she had finished at the end of the service, I said, I just love that illustration that you gave. She had, she had talked to a friend of hers that was from France this week. And her French friend had said she needed to encourage people to find joy again in light of what had happened, to find joy again. And Madeline had connected these two pieces, the hands of Jesus and joy, and been able to translate it to the children. Madeline totally gets it. She totally gets it. Awareness of the changing state of God's work in and through us in the now and the not yet. I believe that is what Jesus means when he says our joy can be complete. When we find an awareness of how we fit within our space as the hands and face and heart of Jesus, the exploration of God's love through us to us and for others. And interestingly, I observe this in many of you often when life gets messy and you need to call on your faith deposits in order to touch again the joy of your life. In 2015, for this half of the year, I have been emphasizing in most of my sermons the beginnings of what it means to be transformed in Jesus and then to Connect that to transforming ministry all around us. And I've been greatly encouraged that many of you are taking time every day to see what is beyond what is commonly considered in the inertia of modern life, the frantic pace of modern life, and to open your spirit to an experience of the extraordinary in the ordinary. Which brings me to the major irony of a life of faith. When we step into the new and unfamiliar of faith, we don't cease being ordinary people. We're going to be called crazy by some folks. We're going to be dismissed by others. Imperfect for sure as we are all vessels of clay, vessels that God wants to be revealed through as we discover and are guided by the Holy Spirit. It's the basics of faith, what you do, what you say, how you act that matters. It's the small things that really are telling of are you exploring the joy of Jesus in the midst of all that the Holy Spirit is partnering with us. And we have much to be grateful for and thankful for here at St. Timothy's. Ministry is bubbling up in lots of different places. And as that good news is happening for us, we get struck hard when we're shaken by these events of terror and power and cruelty and loss that have taken and dominated ours and the world's interest these last couple weeks. It's frustrating and it can be wearying Recognizing the kingdom of God shares space with the kingdoms of this world. It's frustrating and can make us weary trying to hold on to a faith-filled trust that God is present and speaking with the whole human race, even those that don't know God. And when they don't recognize that God is still present and still speaking, we wonder what is our place in all of this? It is the last sentence of today's gospel that I believe is so helpful and hopeful for us. 
Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice, Jesus told Pilate. Now, we live in an age where all truth is subjective, meaning truth is whatever you think it is or whatever works for you in the moment. Everything is so relative that the word truth is now entirely drained of much real meaning. Since everyone has their own truth, like they have their own fingerprints. Jesus doesn't say that truth is relative, nor does he imply that truth is something that we can possess. Jesus says, his kingdom is not of this world, and those who belong to the truth listen to his voice. Truth isn't something that we own, nor is truth simply the most legitimate idea, concept, or doctrine. Jesus tells Pilate, truth is something you belong to, or more accurately, someone you belong to. Your belongingness to the truth is determined by God who has called you out of the darkness into light. Your belongingness to the truth, to the person of Jesus, is simply not determined by family or economic status or friend groups or even a church. It's not determined by religiosity or moral purity or political categories. Your belongingness to the truth is determined by the voice of Jesus who calls to you and you hear and respond to that voice. In the mystery of the Eucharist, in the clumsiness of community, and in every stranger who bears Jesus' face, and your response to illuminate the face of Jesus to them, in the midst of all that has and will happen, keep listening. Keep listening for his voice.